Hello, class. Um, thank you for joining this uh, pre-recorded lecture. Uh, this is our first pre-recorded lecture for this class. In this lecture, I will discuss the topic pastoral authority, pastoral authority. In, in both secular and ecclesiastical life, according to Ray Naden, misconceptions about authority continue to challenge organizational life everywhere, including our church. So there are many individuals, they have misconceptions as it relates to pastoral authority. Today in this lecture, I'll try to you know, bring some light as it relates to pastoral authority. And we'll jump into an overview of pastoral authority in the New Testament. When you think about pastoral authority in the New Testament, what does the New Testament has to say about pastoral authority? According to the New Testament, the Greek word for authority is exousia, which is translated as power to act or authority. Uh, th this word is translated as weight, especially, you know, moral authority or moral influence in a quasi sense. Uh, this word is derived from, you know, later Judaism to mean spiritual authority and hence, you know, also earthy, earthly authority. Exousia carries the connotation of conferred power or delegated empowerment or what we call authorization, operating in a designated sense. Delegated power refers to the authority God gives to his saints, authorizing them to act to the extent they are guided by faith, which is, you know, through his revealed word. And so that's what we are talking about when we are talking about authority. In the New Testament, authority uh, occurs 102 times are the word exousia, which is the word for the Greek word for authority in the New Testament. According to the New Testament, authority may find expression in both destructive and constructive ways or freeing and crippling ways. And so again, we, we can see that if you do a survey of the word authority in the New Testament exousia, then you can see that it's used in both constructive and destructive ways or freeing and crippling ways. Also, you know, biblical authority is God-given. Biblical authority is God-given. So authority is something that biblical authority that is that we receive from God it's a gift next thing about authority is that love is the basis of biblical authority let me say that again love is the basis of biblical authority and so for biblical authority it empowers people and frees them to grow and fulfills God's loving destiny for them. So again, you know, biblical authority is empowering. It liberates, you know, people to grow and to mature and to develop and to fulfill God's destiny for them. So in other words, you know, biblical authority is not about control, is not about, you know, uh, trying to be God in someone's life and trying to dictate that person's future. But instead, it empowers and it frees and it allows people to grow and mature. Pastoral authority needs to be viewed in light of Jesus' statement about being a servant or descending into greatness in Matthew chapter 20, 25 through 28. You know, when the disciples were wondering who was you know, uh, you know, great, uh, who should be your servant? But Jesus says that those who want to be greatest among you, let him be your servant. And so, you know, this concept of descending into greatness. And so again, you, 
uh, for for the world, authority is hierarchical, you know, up and down. But for for the kingdom of God, there is an inverse in that. In other words, you descend into greatness. Authority helps people to to grow and become wiser, healthier, freer, and more autonomous. So let me say that again. Biblical authority, and when authority is used in the right way, it helps people to grow, you know, to mature, as it were, and become wiser, healthier, freer, and more autonomous. In other words, that person is able to, you know, practice what we call self-direction or is able to make his or her own decisions. That's biblical authority right there. And that's, in essence, pastoral authority. Love is the intrinsic attribute of biblical authority. So let me say that again. Love is the intrinsic attribute of biblical authority. You know, biblical authority, in other words, the driver of biblical authority is love and it's intrinsic, you know, meaning internal as opposed to extrinsic, which is external. So love again is the intrinsic attribute or driver of biblical authority, which seeks the interest, the growth, and freedom of others, not their control. So let me say that again. Love is the intrinsic attribute of biblical authority, which seeks the interest, growth, and freedom of others and not their control. So let's talk about, you know, the different types of authority. So when we think about authority, there are different types of authority. The first is what we call the authority of Christ, which we call the Christological authority, the authority of Christ, Christological authority. You know, because we know that based in scripture that every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we're talking about the authority of Christ. And so if you remember that there were some people who came to Jesus and say, okay, you know, by what authority do you do these things? And Jesus turned and said to them, if you can tell me, by what authority, you know, John did these things, whether it were, you know, um, he did it by men or God and so forth. So Jesus is the authority of Christ we're talking about, which is a Christological authority. The second authority also we talk about is the canon or the canonic canonical authority, which is the biblical authority or textual authority. And we know that textual authority was the first authority because of, you know, text, um, because of the, you know, biblical text. So you had textual authority where the, 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 the written word had authority, as it were. So we have the canonical authority, which is biblical or textual authority. And also we have Christological authority. The next one that we have is what, what, what we call the, the authority of the church or what is known as the ecclesiastical authority. And in this ecclesiastical authority, types of ecclesiastical authority, you know, are the church manual, the working policies of the church the 28 fundamentals. And so these are ecclesiastical authority. Next, we will focus on pastoral authority and ethics, pastoral authority and ethics. It's, it's very important that there is a connection that if pastoral authority are to be used in the way that God intended for it to use or being used in its true biblical sense, it cannot be devoid from ethics. It cannot be devoid from ethics. And so in this section, we'll talk about pastoral authority and ethics. The first thing is that, you know, pastoral authority, when used appropriately, will subscribe to, you know, the, the five core principles of ethics. And the first is beneficence, which is doing good or for the good of others. So pastoral authority, when used in the true biblical sense, you know, is doing good, you know, for others or, you know, are doing good to and for others. 
uh, because it subscribes to the ethical principle of beneficence. Next one is that pastoral authority, when used appropriately, you know, adheres to the, 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 the ethical principle of non-malfeasance. And non-malfeasance is to do no harm, do no harm. And so, again, you cannot, you, you know, we should not, or we must not use our pastoral authority, uh, you know, to, to advance our own interests at the expense of others, whether that be our patients, whether that be parishioners or any other or individuals that we interact with. Next one is that, Pastoral authority respects the, the core principle of autonomy, which is the right to self-determination. And so pastoral authority then does not force um, itself on other people, but understand that when that is being used in an ethical sense, will allow for the right to self-determination where the individual is able to make his or her own decisions or choices. Next one, pastoral authority, when used appropriately, subscribe to the, the ethical principle of justice, which is fair treatment, fair treatment. And so, again, pastoral authority, you know, uh, should be used in a way that advocate and that provide uh, fair treatment. Next one, that pastoral authority is used to, to you know, um, to to align with is the ethical principle of fidelity. Fidelity is loyalty. So, you know, show loyalty to those you serve. Faithfulness to a person, cause, or belief, demonstrating by continuing loyalty and support. And so for our patients, we are loyal to provide them the best, you know, possible care, you know, loyal to making sure that we are providing what they request. Um, also, we're going to talk about some appropriate, um, appropriate use of pastoral authorities in some ways that pastoral authority, how oh, oh, can it be used appropriately, especially in the chaplaincy context. And so the first, we use our pastoral authority to advocate for patients and families. And that could be, you know, for example, a patient might be in pain and you see the patient's far knitting up. So we go and talk to the nurse and, and find out if the nurse can talk to the doctor to get a pain prescription written so that the patient can be at ease, advocate for patients and families. To give patients and families permission to grieve because sometimes, uh, you know, some patients or, you know, or family members may not, you know, be grieving. They think that it's, it's, it's not, it's not okay to grieve and, you know, so forth. They're bottling up. And so as chaplains, we, we give them permission um, to grieve in that sense, to be able to express themselves, express their disappointment, express their pain, express their frustration regarding what they are going through, whether that be a diagnosis, whether be, that be, um, you know, a uh, family conflict or whether that be the death of a loved one, you know, that it's it's okay to grieve. Uh, also advocate for for team members, and we can do this by, by advocating for their needs, you know, in terms of leadership, being a sounding board for team members uh, with the leadership as well. Next one is guide leaders and spiritual matters. So again, we use our pastoral authority to guide leaders on spiritual matters so that, you know, they can understand, you know, uh, certain uh you know, spiritual matters or regarding spiritual questions, and we we provide that guidance. So, so again, thanks for uh, joining uh, this lecture on pastoral authority, because indeed we have an obligation to ensure that pastoral authority is used appropriately. And again, the, the, the intrinsic nature of pastoral authority is that love is at the center of pastoral authority. And I, and I hope that at the end of this lecture, 
that you would have gained something and you would have been able to broaden your scope of pastoral authority and know that it's delegated authority as it relates to the use of exousia in the biblical context. But again, pastoral authority cannot be divided from ethics. It must follow the five core principles of ethics, which are beneficence, non-malfeasance, uh, autonomy, justice, and fidelity. Thanks for joining this lecture today, and I hope that it will be a blessing to you.